The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everybody. We're glad you could be with us today for our uh, second in our annual uh, webinar series, Social Entrepreneurship, Making Your Mark in the World. Um, we have a distinguished group of panelists with us today, and um, we're going to learn a little bit about social entrepreneurship, what it is, and then we're going to hear some great stories of two social entrepreneurs and how they're making an impact in the world. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Kurobi from Ashoka. Uh, Ashoka is one of the premier organizations in working with social entrepreneurship and promoting uh, social entrepreneurship in uh, the world today. And so I will allow uh, Kurobi to tell you a little bit more about Sh Ashoka and get us started. So Kurobi, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. And good afternoon, everyone. And I wanted to thank you for having me today. Um, if you could move to the next slide. Um, and even the next one after that. And um, I'd just like to say it's a pleasure to talk to you about Ashoka uh, today. I've been with Ashoka a little bit over three years. And Ashoka is the world's largest community of leading social entrepreneurs uh, whom we elect as Ashoka Fellows. We have over 2,500 social entrepreneurs who work in about 70 countries. Uh, social entrepreneurs are people who use entrepreneurial tools and strategies to solve pressing social problems. Um, Ashoka focuses on its support on people, not projects, um, which is a very important distinction. We look for leaders um, and support the development of those people and leadership skills rather than supporting individual projects. We are sector and issue agnostic. Uh, what that means is that we we don't adhere to sort of the traditional boundaries um, among education, health, environment, and other social issues. Um, but rather, we see those issues as being highly interconnected. And we often find that innovation actually cuts across those boundaries. Um, and we also work hard to build an ecosystem by connecting business and social enterprises. Um, increasingly, we're seeing a convergence of business and social interest. If you go to the next slide, um, what is a social entrepreneur? Um, it's increasingly a buzzword uh, today. Everyone I meet seems to be a social entrepreneur. But Ashoka has a, a, a rather, I guess, strict definition of it, um, where social entrepreneurs find what's not working, and they solve the problem by changing the system, by spreading the solution, and by persuading entire societies to take leaps. And um, as Andrew mentioned, Chris and Molly a bit later in this webinar will share their work as social entrepreneurs. And on the next slide, you'll see one of the quotations from our uh, founder and CEO, Bill Drayton. Bill Drayton actually is credited with coining the term social entrepreneur. He talks about social entrepreneurs are not content just to give a fish or teach how to fish but they'll not rest until they've revolutionized the fishing industry. And so the distinction here is that Ashoka and its fellows are focused on systemic change. They're focused on changing the pattern in the field. So for example, it's, it's less about building another school or another healthcare facility, but, in, but it's more about changing the system of how education happens and um, is facilitated or changing how healthcare is achieved. On the next slide, you'll see that the um, Ashoka Fellows must meet five core criteria. Um, and Chris and Molly probably know these well, remembering them from the selection process. But each fellow is um, the first criteria is they must have a new idea. That, and a new idea that changes the pattern in the field, whether it's human rights or environment or even something that, that cuts across several of those. It must change the system. So um, it, it, that's the first, we call it the knockout test. 
The second is creativity. Um, successful social entrepreneurs must be creative both as goal-setting visionaries and also as problem solvers who are capable of turning their visions into reality. So they have to be very practical on the ground, strategic uh, doers as well as visionaries. Uh, third, entrepreneurial quality. Um, this really defines leaders who see opportunities for change and innovation and have the persistence and dedication uh, to devote themselves entirely to making that change happen. The fourth criteria is ethical fiber. Um, this isn't just sort of a, a, a throwaway kind of criteria. It's, it's critically important because as social entrepreneurs seek to change a fundamental pattern in society, they must be able to inspire trust among many, many different kinds of people and stakeholders in order to introduce that structural change to society. And then the last criteria is around the social impact of the idea. So Ashoka is only really interested in ideas that will change the field at a national or a regional level. Um, again, it, it's, it's, Ashoka is not focusing on local, small-scale kinds of results. We're interested in ideas that will have significant social impact. On the next slide, you'll see where we work. Um, uh, as I said, we're in over 70 countries and five continents. We elected our first fellow in 1981. And since then, we've been committed to electing, uh, uh, supporting social entrepreneurs um, wherever, from large cities to rural areas, um, from stable democracies to nations in transition. Um, and we're currently in a period of rapid expansion. Um, and as the slide shows, this is some of the statistics uh, that we look at when we assess our impact. So 83% um, of fellows change a system at a national level within 10 years of election. Um, and 90% of fellows' ideas are replicated by other groups. Um, and then finally, 60% of fellows change national policy or regulations within five years of election. So those are a couple of the indicators that we use to try to answer the question of our fellows achieving the systemic change that they are seeking to. And on the next slide, um, one of the other things that we try to do as the numbers of fellows are increasing, um, once elected an Ashoka Fellow, it is a life, uh, you're elected for life. It's not a, it's not a time-bound uh, fellowship. Um, but as, as the numbers of fellows are increasing, we're able to identify patterns and insights that help the broader field of social change. And these patterns and insights fall into sort of three broad categories. First is around the in-depth knowledge of sort of individual models and strategies that the fellows are using. So, you know, for example, I know that there's a, a, a great deal of interest in um, various models that have been used to spread the social impact and to spread the idea. And I know Molly's work is often spoken of in this regard. Um, the second uh, sort of insight pattern that we look for is looking at patterns across um, solutions and innovations. So for example, a number of our fellows, um, like Chris, are uh, changing our definitions of a classroom and what happens in the classroom. So thinking, thinking outside the classroom um, or changing what happens in a traditional classroom is, is a clear pattern. And then thirdly, we look to distill underlying principles that can change the paradigm and system. So just another example is that many of uh, Ashoka Fellows have found that by focusing on serving the full market um, rather than just the poorest, as is often traditional for, um, for many social service organizations, but instead serving everyone, the rich and the poor, that can provide opportunities for tiered pricing so that wealthier clients actually are able to subsidize the poor ones. So those are just a couple of examples. So on the next slide, um, this is really Ashoka's core belief that the 
only answer to more problems is more problem solvers. Um, this is a belief in people as problem solvers, in people as change makers, and we work to strengthen systems that support people as change makers. And if you go to the next slide, uh, we certainly invite you to be part of this change. And on the next slide, I think that's the final one. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Karobi. <clears throat> you know, I think one of the things that's important about family businesses is we all have uh, an important role in our communities and play an important role in our communities and have a huge social impact. And I think one of the really exciting things about this concept of social entrepreneurship is taking those skills and those uh, pieces of knowledge and, and starting to apply them to the big social problems that, that we face in our world. And uh, I've found that nobody's more dedicated to their communities and, and society than, than family businesses from a, a family business uh, from a business perspective, anyway. So now uh, we get the honor of hearing uh, a little bit about two unique stories um, in the social entrepreneurship world. Um, we'll start with Molly Barker, who's with an organization and uh, called Girls on the Run. So Molly. That's right. Um, that is me. And um, if we could go to the next slide, that would be great. And then the next slide. Um, so I started Girls on the Run in 1996, and I think one little girl in our program put it best that um, Girls on the Run is helping girls become the boss of their own brain. So the idea is that they can critically think through a lot of the um, challenges that may come their way and then and make healthy decisions that really enhance who they are. So uh, next slide. So very quickly, let me just fill you in on a little bit about our story and why I started the organization. Um, I grew up in the seven, 60s and 70s in the South. And around 1971, I was in middle school, that critical age where uh, lots of people are undergoing a dramatic amount of change, both physically and emotionally, and switched schools. And, um, not that that in and of itself is, is a big deal, but I was one of three new students at a school that uh, had most of the students have been together since kindergarten, and I can remember feeling quite invisible. And about three weeks into the school year, an announcement was made that we would be running the mile for PE. And I've always been quite a bit of a tomboy, so when this announcement was made, I was actually quite excited that I was like going to no longer be Molly the invisible girl, but I was going to be Molly the runner girl. So I showed up for the mile on that particular day, uh, set off on the journey four times around a quarter mile track, and um, on the second lap uh, tripped and had a very dramatic fall to the ground, sprained my ankle. Are you still there? Yeah, we're still here. Okay, sorry, I just lost you on the computer screen. Um, sprained my ankle, came back around to the teacher, and um, I'm sure she said something like, you know, we'll, we'll take care of that in a minute. But this is where the real story for Girls on the Run begins, because what I heard her say and what she said were probably very different. What I heard her say was something like, well, Molly, why don't you sit here while all the other girls finish? And it was in a very... Um, sort of condemning and shaming tone. And this is a context we speak of frequently at Girls on the Run called the Girl Box. And something around, something happens to girls around middle school where these formerly vibrant, like alive little beings, begin to hear and see the world through this view that somehow indicates that they are not good enough. And that context varies from region to region or ethnicity and even socioeconomic status. You know, for me growing up in the 70s, I wasn't pretty enough or smart enough or uh, uh, thin enough. It just kind of varies from group to group. But at the core of it is this belief somehow that I'm not good enough. So um, I discovered um, a few years later that running really was a reprieve from that negative context. And it was a place of real empowerment for me. So. Uh, most of my life, at least until I was 32, um, these two worlds were sort of in conflict. This girl that would view the world through this negative 
voice that was saying, you know, you're not smart enough or whatever enough, and then this empowered runner girl. So when I um, turned 32, I basically had an epiphany where I really did come to this realization that um, truly the only thing that can define who I am uh, is me. <laughs> and I thought, wouldn't it be great to create a program or some sort of some sort of curriculum that would allow girls at that young age, at that critical age, just prior to adolescence, where they could really tap into their power and realize that the only person that can limit their potential um, is themselves. And, and this is a very um, currently a very American program. I, um, we have had lots of queries from around the world, but currently the context is very American. So I started the program. In 1996, with 13 girls, I wrote out the first curriculum, um, and it just has been a wild ride ever since. The program has grown, and we'll see those numbers in a minute. But basically, um, we'll go ahead to the next slide. So um, our mission, and I'm just going to go through these quickly. Um, our mission is to inspire girls to be joyful, healthy, and confident using a fun experience-based curriculum, which creatively integrates running. Um, how we do this is through a life-changing experiential learning program for girls age 8 to 13. The programs combine training for a 3.1-mile running event with self-esteem enhancing uplifting workouts. And our vision, which is, I get chill bumps every time I read it, um, we envision a world where every girl knows and activates her limitless potential and is free to boldly pursue her dreams. So if we go to the next slide. Um, these are our core values, and I'm going to save those because I want to make sure I have enough time um, at the end of the presentation. But those will be available to you if you guys want to look at them. You can go to the next slide. So the big idea for Girls on the Run, and I will have to um, give a shout out to Ashoka, that just going through the um, nomination process was a tremendous, amazing experience because it really did help me articulate this big idea. And I was kind of having a hard time with it before then. but to mobilize a social movement to shift the consciousness of individuals, institutions, and organizations so that liberation starts when women are girls, continues throughout life, and liberates all of society in the process. The overarching goal is to create a more inclusive, compassionate, and peaceful society so that girls and women can recognize and achieve their highest human potential. Next slide, please. So just very quickly, the next several slides will go over kind of the growth and, and the program has had an amazing, um, gosh, just an amazing story over the last 16 years. So currently Girls on the Run is in 200 cities across 45 states. We're also in Canada. Um, how we're set up is we have uh, two models. Basically, a council can establish itself as an, ind an independent 501c3 within a city or it can partner with an existing nonprofit. And those are about um, half and half currently. If you'll go to the next slide. So 103 of our councils are those 501c3s that I indicated, and another 97 are the affiliates. We partner with YMCAs and hospitals, health departments, YWCAs, and school systems. Next slide, please. Um, the growth has just been remarkable. So if you think, of, this, this kind of blows me away, actually. So in 1996, there were 13 girls. And you can see that um, fiscal year 2011, we served 108,880 girls. And uh, we're showing about a 37% increase in number of girls served every year. And that's thanks to an incredible gosh, an incredible force of volunteers. Um, next slide. I think that shows. So we use coaches who volunteer for the organization. And um, we're still gathering our 2011 fiscal year data on this. But um, 16,000 people helped deliver this program in um, all across the nation. The next slide. Um, the total number of volunteers, and we are completely volunteer driven, and we do have some paid staff, 36,000 people, both men and women, help, um, help us reach all these girls. <laughs> Next slide, please. 
Um, we have two programs. We have a program for third, fourth, and fifth graders, and then we have a program for middle schoolers. Um, ever since I started the program, the numbers have stayed pretty consistent in this realm. So right now we're analyzing whether that, that we, we believe we need to make some changes to that middle school curriculum. We think the current model is just too taxing on their time. They've got too many other other things to do in middle school. So we're, we're currently going to revamp that and recreate something new, I believe. Next slide. Um, I'm very proud of this. And, and like Karavi was saying, we, we are one of those that serve all girls. And um, currently, about 33% of our girls receive scholarship assistance, financial assistance. That's in the neighborhood of $3 million. And um, um, it varies from city to city. Right there in Chicago, the significant number, there's a high, much higher number of girls receiving financial assistance. It, it does vary from region to region. Next slide, please. Um, the total number of places delivering the program, um, right now there's 4,000, a little over, probably around 5,000 at this point, and that would be at schools and wise, rec centers, churches, synagogues, basically anywhere a kid is, we try to, to find them there. So rather than someone coming to a site, we coming to us, we go to a site. Next slide. And we also, at the end of this 12 weeks, have what we call the Girls on the Run 5K. And I invite all of you, if you've never um, been to one, you should come. Um, there will be no words. I hope you can hear the smile in my voice. I don't think there's any words that could describe or articulate the joy that is present at these events um, as these kids, I'm getting emotional, ah, as these kids cross the finish line. It's, truly really amazing, the 12 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks, all the things they've been through and then to get to celebrate that with their peers is significant. And um, those those number of 5Ks are, are growing with each year. And currently, we're the second largest 5K series behind Race for the Cure. So that's a, a very exciting number for us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just very quickly. This is something that uh, just continues to amaze me. The program is, is sustaining itself, and I'm so proud of our growth and the hard work of all of our volunteers and councils. But um, you can see our program fees, the gross revenue is around $9 million, and that we've awarded around $3 million in scholarships. So we're always looking for more support in that realm so we can reach more girls. Next slide, please. And the contributed income um, continues to increase. What I didn't include was a slide. We get a significant amount of income from um, corporate partners. Um, um, Athleta is a corporate partner currently, and Procter and & Gamble, and there's a significant number of others. But if it were not for them, I, I, it's just such a unified, um, unified uh, relationship we have with these partners. All right, next slide. And this is our total council revenue. So um, I remember when I got my first check in um, 1996 for $650, and uh, 2010 our council revenue, and this doesn't include the national office, is around $13 million. So, and we're just continue to grow. It's it's really exciting. More, so we're just serving more and more girls. All right, next slide. Um, you know, we can keep going. I don't want to run out of time here, so. Um, actually, I'm a, okay. So um, one area that we're really working hard on for this whole sustainable piece is getting our, our leadership and our staff and all of our offices to really pursue this as a full-time job. Many of them are working, being paid for 20 hours a week, but they're working 30 or 40. So we're really, really trying to educate our councils on fund development, how to how to manage their time, how to um, make sure that they pay themselves uh, so that we can have a sustainable model should should they leave. We want to make sure that we can replace them. Um, so it's been interesting. We have the history of the organization starting with very passionate people, but how do you balance that out with the more um, strategic thinking? So it's, it's a, a interesting line to educate people on that while maintaining their passion. Uh, and that's been probably the biggest challenge we've had. All right, next slide, please. 
Um, the interest in girls on the run continues to increase, and we've had a significant amount of media, which has just been awesome. Um, we've never really done any press releases, and yet people, um, it's just a feel-good story, and all of our cities get a great deal of media. Um, one thing that I'm very, very proud of is, um, I guess it was about six years ago, we made a very conscious decision to slow down the growth. So um, what you can see here is we we get we had so many queer inquiries. You know, you see that those increased, but the number of applications we distributed proportionately was a lot lower. And so too were the intent forms. You can see that who is applying though is far more qualified to receive the council leadership. So we've been very very um, intentional with how we've grown the program, and I'm just so proud of um, how we've done that. That was very hard for me to um, step back and allow kind of control the growth, and I'm surrounded by amazing people who kind of helped me, help me let that go. All right, next slide. OK, um, one other did thing I did want to say that was just fascinating in somebody's remarks. They were talking about the persistence of a social entrepreneur, and I, I would I would say that of all the character traits that I've noted with all of my Ashoka fellows and friends, is there is this just unbelievable persistence that it's it's as if nothing will stop us, and um, uh, I think that that is attributable to many entrepreneurs, but then applied in the social realm, can just be overwhelming, um, and so I I just. I don't know. I just feel like that's a key component that um, I wanted to highlight in the conversation. And that's it. Great. Thanks, Molly. We'll uh, yep. get back with you for some questions a little bit later. Um, sure. But next, I want to uh, introduce Chris Baum, who's the co-founder and executive director of Spark. Chris? Terrific. Uh, well, thanks, Andrew and Molly. Thank you so much for that story. It was really inspiring to hear. And uh, what I'll share is uh, our own story through Spark, uh, some of our experience and how we've grown as well, um, some of our challenges in growth, uh, and then also how it applies to family business. Uh, because as I'm sure um, is true with you also, Molly, we work very closely with business uh, to accomplish our work. So to start off, and we can go right to the next slide. Uh, just want to talk through, um, you can go right onto the, the, there we go, the slide, why Spark exists. Um, oh, sorry, you can actually go to the slide that uh, has the numbers on it. So these numbers that you're seeing in front of you are the dropout rates uh, in some of the largest American cities. It's a, these numbers still astonish me to this day, and I think one of our most important uh, pieces of work at Spark is simply to raise awareness about uh, the problem that exists and the resources that are not being well used to address it. So you can see Detroit, uh, unfortunately, has the leadership role here with 75% of their, their young people dropping out of high school. Um, but what you'll also see here is that in most American cities, uh, more than half of all young people drop out. Uh, the national average is 30% when you factor in uh, wealthier communities as well. But the urban average and, and every urban community that we work in uh, is close to 50%, if not over. So this is the problem that we're trying to address. And uh, when I was first uh, getting involved, I, I went to business school and then taught seventh grade, realized that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And when I was first getting involved and, and taking my teaching experience, blending it with my business experience and trying to understand how do I address this problem? Uh, what came to mind for me was that if students see relevance, if they understand how what they're doing in school connects to what they want later in life, uh, they'll have much more motivation, much more success in school. To give them that sense of relevance, they have to have a relationship. You know, if you're growing up in a poor community, whether it's in Chicago or the east side of Los Angeles, and everyone in your neighborhood has minimum wage jobs, if they have jobs at all, and you see someone on TV, for example, who is a doctor, it's pretty hard to feel like that is accessible. Whereas if you have a mentor who's a doctor who introduces you to what it's like to enter that profession and how they got there, that enables you to make your dream feel real and to motivate yourself to succeed in school. So uh, you can go on to the next slide. Um, we've been fortunate, uh, this was just here as a reference for a video that I think was sent out um, that we've had some great um, publicity over the last year on, uh, with Brian Williams and others talking about um, what uh, do communities look like when apprenticeships are introduced 
uh, as an educational tool. And that's what Spark is all about. So we can go uh, right on to the next slide. Uh, our core mission is to address the dropout rate by creating one-on-one -on -one apprenticeships uh, for young people uh, when they're at their most vulnerable years. So just as Molly was saying, uh, in their seventh and eighth grade years during middle school. Uh, we identify the students who are most likely to drop out uh, based on their income status, struggles in school, and then we match them one-on-one -on -one, uh, with a professional who has the job that that student dreams of having. So here you can see with these photos, uh, we have students who are uh, structural engineers, doctors, firefighters, uh, literally every profession you can imagine. Uh, and when I referenced earlier that these, there are resources that aren't being well utilized, those resources are professionals and workplaces. Uh, family businesses may be further along uh, than the rest of the pack in this, but if you think about your workplace and how often a young person is in there learning and getting a sense for you know, how they can imagine themselves in that workplace, that most people say it doesn't happen very often. And what we're trying to show is that these workplaces are everywhere and they're very open to doing this kind of work when there's a nice structure for it. And the students are certainly everywhere as well. Uh, I'll tell you one very brief story. The student that you see here on your left uh, with the hard hat on, this is a student who uh, was an immigrant to California. Um, when we uh, interviewed him, he'd been referred to us as a student who was uh, failing classes in school, disengaged. Um, we asked him what he wanted to try. If he could have any job in the world, what would it be? And he said that um, he had spent the summer in Guatemala helping his uncle build a house, and he loved the idea of building. So uh, we matched him with a firm that uh, actually I think maybe a family business uh, that does structural engineering. And over the course of a semester with Spark, he started off, uh, he was actually working on the Fairmont Hotel. Those who have been to San Francisco, it's kind of a, a you know, landmark hotel. Um, his project started with going out to the hotel site and understanding uh, what is it like to have client communication, understanding the scope of the project. They took samples from the exterior of the hotel, brought it back to their lab, uh, he learned about the math and science that goes into structural engineering. He saw them build out plans for the changes they were going to make and help them do that. And at the very end, this photo is from one of his last days of apprenticeship. He was on site with his hard hat on as they were drilling reinforcing rods into the hotel. He saw the entire scope of how the things that he's learning in school get used uh, by real people and that he has access to jobs like that. This is a student whose math grade significantly improved and whose participation and confidence really improved because he saw he had a path. Um, so that's the, that's the essence of the program. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how as an organization we've grown. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So um, we started in the Bay Area. Uh, our first program was in 2005. And uh, as we've scaled uh, to different regions of the US over the last couple of years, um, and I'm sure this is an experience that a lot of family businesses have had also, you know, each, uh, each kind of phase of growth for us has taught us a lot, has stretched us, um, and ultimately it's, it's made the organization stronger. So our Bay Area work, we have 300 active apprenticeships here. Um, and so that's 300 slots that are continually being refilled with new students. Um, we then opened in Los Angeles and learned a lot about how to grow. Uh, when we first started to grow, we did it through a consulting model, and we realized that we need to have a higher touch uh, than pure consulting in order to, to make sure the quality was there. So we switched to kind of a hybrid approach where uh, schools take on a large part of the implementation of the model. We have small teams in each city that are there to support the apprenticeships and support quality. Uh, we then opened in Chicago, which taught us a lot about working in a big urban environment directly with the district in close uh, collaboration with the school district. Um, and then we've since opened and uh, are about to open in Philadelphia uh, and Oakland as well. Uh, quick note on kind of what the impact has been, and then I'll talk more about uh, kind of our experience and challenges and growth. We've been able to track now since it's been uh, now seven years, our students all the way through high school and some into college. And what's been amazing as we uh, track students and get data from school districts, we see that immediately after students finish their apprenticeships, they have improvements in grades. Later after that, their attendance starts to improve. Uh, they have fewer suspensions in high school. And our first cohort of students uh, that's made it all the way through has a 98% graduation rate from high school. So it's really driving home the point. Uh, and we're not the ones to invent the idea of apprenticeships by any means, but uh, we're the only organization doing it for middle school students in the US that this is the age to reach kids. If you get them excited here, you get them a, a much more successful path through high school and beyond. Um, and so this ties back to what Karobi was saying about uh, why we were supported by Ashoka and that connection is that the potential for this is everywhere. 
Uh, there are students in need in every city. There are workplaces in every city. Uh, those two, you know, the need and the supply of resources actually exist everywhere. Uh, and our challenge is just how do we scale? How do we create the lightest weight bridge between those two groups so that we can efficiently build something that can serve students across the U.S.? Um, so we can go to the next slide. So um, on that note, our vision is that over the next 20 years, um, we'll be able to serve 200,000 young people cumulatively uh, from the most underserved communities in the U.S. Uh, with the results that I've laid out already about increased educational achievement. Um, and beyond that, and this also goes back to what Kroby was saying, uh, part of our mission is to change policy. You know, our work now is to really demonstrate that the program can work at scale. Uh, but as we grow, we have increasing amounts of data. We have an increasing ability to shape how education policy happens. Uh, and our goal in that domain is to make apprenticeships an embedded part of school, particularly in urban areas that have the, the toughest problems to deal with around the dropout rate. Uh, so we can go right on to the next one. So some of our challenges, these are all going to sound very familiar also to um, people involved in, in family businesses. Um, first was just to build our program model, you know, our business case. Uh, that one I've checked off, not that it's ever a fully complete uh, process, but we've really learned the pillars of how you create meaningful apprenticeships for young people. Then it was how to set up our partnerships. So where do we exist in the world of education? And where do we exist in the corporate world? How do we make our pitch to corporations that this is a valuable thing for them to do both as corporate citizens, but also you know, in a more self-interested way for their employees to be engaged and happy to stick around? Um, what we're now uh, addressing as our key challenges are how do we attract sufficient risk capital? And this I'll talk about in the last slide also. But you know, philanthropy often, um, you would think in some ways it could be the highest risk capital because it doesn't require a financial return and often it's given from foundations that exist uh, in perpetuity, but philanthropy is often very risk averse. And as a growing nonprofit, you know, if I were, for example, starting a for-profit, there would be so many different uh, potential ways to go, not to say that it would be easy at all, but potential sources of financing to grow, uh, whether venture capital or more traditional debt. Uh, as a nonprofit, I have very few uh, sources of capital to really grow. So one of our big challenges is how do we move beyond you know, the important you know, $100 donor but get to donors that are supporting us in the millions of dollars to build something on a much larger scale. Uh, and then the last piece of the reference is how do we shift policy? How do we start to play in that world as we have increasing amounts of data to back up uh, our story about the impact that we have? Uh, so we can go on to the next one. So I want to point out a couple ways um, where business, but particularly family business, can be involved. And some of this may be very obvious to people who are already uh, closely involved with nonprofits, but I just want to highlight some ways that um, we've had particularly high impact relationships with family businesses. Um, one is encouraging board service. Uh, we've worked with some businesses where they have a, a very clear policy that as they have an up-and-coming, uh, whether it's a new person to run the business, perhaps a new generation of the family, or just an up-and-coming executive, um, that they make a board service for a nonprofit a required part of that person's path. Um, now, obviously, a lot, we find a lot of great people when it's not required, but I think it's a really nice way that a business can uh, make its, its commitment to nonprofit work very clear and also can inject the special skills that that business has into the nonprofit world. And I think in that sense, it, it depends very much on what the sector is. We've worked with people in the technology world who help us with our tech problems, people in the finance world who help us with that. Uh, so on and so forth. The second is building volunteer cultures. This, I think, it sounds like a very obvious one, but I want to put a twist on it, and that is, how can you use time during the workday to volunteer? Um, I think a lot of people might have uh, an initial reaction that that time during the workday needs to be protected just for work, and of course that's where the majority of it, a um, very large majority of it, needs to go. But uh, what we're finding is that a lot of young, uh, particularly young professionals, who work long hours, um, they don't have any ability to volunteer uh, during the week uh, unless it's during the workday. Their weekends, they may commute, it may not be convenient, uh, they may not want to use that time for volunteering. Um, so if a business can enable them to use a small portion of their workday to volunteer, that person is going to be much happier and feels like at their workplace that interest of theirs is getting recognized. Um, we have a lot of young professionals who volunteer as mentors, and they do it two hours a week uh, for 10 weeks out of the year. So a total of 20 hours of time, uh, which is usually a late afternoon when a student comes after school to do their apprenticeship. 
it's a very low impact way um, that the business can recognize that employee's interest. Um, and it's amazing for our students to get to see the workplaces and make it really real. Um, and then the last one, uh, to reference what I said earlier, is you know, family businesses uh, are entrepreneurial. They're more entrepreneurial than the average business. We need that entrepreneurial mindset in philanthropy. Uh, a lot of philanthropy is very traditional. Uh, it's not given strategically, and it's not uh, comfortable with risk always. Um, now, Ashoka is very different. I want to make sure that I'm not making too blanket of a statement here, but uh, there is huge opportunity to have enormous impact in philanthropy by being comfortable with risk, uh, by investing in a promising organization um, that needs growth capital to scale. I think family businesses get that. Um, so I would just urge people who are involved in that world to think about ways that they can have impact beyond the normal ways of, of being philanthropists um, by taking their entrepreneurial mindset and applying it. So um, I'll pause there and um, open to questions. But uh, again, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to share our story with you. Great. Thanks so much, Chris. That, that was really uh, inspiring. You know, both, both you and Molly, I just kind of marvel at the... Uh, <laughs> In the vision that it took to, to create both of those organizations and uh, uh, you know seems like a pretty daunting task but you guys have done just such a great job at, at doing that um, Chris I had a, a follow-up question for you and, and that was you know how did that business experience help you in this kind of entrepreneurial endeavor and how did you go from you know being a teacher to uh, saying wow I'm willing to take this risk yeah, well, it, it's very helpful. You know, when I so I went to the Wharton School, studied business, um, and then had a change of heart, became a teacher, and for a while I thought I just made a mistake <laughs> by going to business school, and then I realized it should just be in education. And then when I realized that the way I wanted to address education was through being an entrepreneur, it hit me that the business school was more than worth it. Uh, I think one is just uh, being able to speak the language of business. Uh, you know, a lot of nonprofits that are so driven by the heart of their work have trouble communicating that to more of a business audience, whether those are investors or, or others. Um, so the fact that you know a phrase like return on investment was easy to say <laughs> and comfortable, uh, you know, immediately made building relationships easier. Um, but I also think that the business education really helps with the operational side of nonprofits. This is not the sexiest part, but you know, again, so many nonprofits uh, have the greatest idea, uh, the greatest passion for it but don't have the operational execution and they stumble on finance or HR or something that, you know, it, it, it's all the more a pity to see them stumble because the idea is so good. So I think blending in some business skill into that, um, not to say that it was all mine, but you know, understanding that I, I knew what some of those business areas were where we needed help and could find people with the right skills, um, that's been immensely helpful. Great. Thanks. Karobi, we had a, a question come in from the group and I may have, uh, overlook this, but for those in the audience who want to ask questions, you have a dialogue box on your right-hand side that says chat, and you can type in any questions you have uh, in there, and we'll uh, get those on to the panelists. But one of the questions that somebody already typed in was, um, you know, what's the difference between social entrepreneurship and philanthropy? Karobi, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, I, can, I can try, and, and Chris and Molly, please, uh, please jump in. Um, social entrepreneurship is really, um, social entrepreneurs are the people on the ground who are doing the hard work, just as Chris and Molly are. They are, they come up with the idea, they develop um, a, a model, a program model, or a business strategy to um, sustainably implement a particular idea and to um, have a particular social impact. Um, philanthropy, I think, is, is traditionally more um, finding those good ideas and supporting them, but at some distance often. I mean, obviously, there's a wide range of philanthropists, but I think there's traditionally a little more distance between the, the program and the people you're serving from philanthropists than from social entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know if, if anyone else wants to add something to that. I'll, I'll jump in there. I was going to say one way that um, one thing that I've noticed about people that are getting involved with Girls on the Run, there seems to be this fire that they have, like this this fuel on the inside that they want to not only give, and we have a lot of givers, which is awesome and very philanthropic, but they want to like get their hands involved 
and that's been the for me the difference. Um, we have so many of our volunteers that do work full time jobs that that are that are getting their own they're tapping into their own potential by getting involved with the organization. So there's a little bit of that difference for me too. Like the, all the, the the many entrepreneurs that are living inside of all these people are getting engaged. They're all becoming change makers by getting engaged with those on the run. Great. We had a, another question that came in, which is um, around, uh, I think, the kind of overhead and infrastructure that you guys have in terms of staff. It, it seems like your, your volunteer networks are really large, but uh, um, the question is kind of posed both to Molly and Chris, uh, but what are your kind of staff requirements and how do you, you manage this uh, in the business growth model that you're pursuing? I'll, I'll you say go us, first. Um, oh, go, oh ahead. go ahead, Molly. Uh, well, you know, the way we're set up is um, each of our independent offices that have their own 501c3 have an executive director, they have a staff, I mean, they have a board, they have just everything that an independent 501c3 would have. And so we at the national office establish a working contractual relationship with those folks. And, you know, it is a, a written document and there's certain areas where we allow um, some leeway for our councils, but then there are other areas where we have very, very stringent requirements on how they use the curriculum, the logo, um, how they raise money and things like that. So um, the volunteers are actually the ones on the ground delivering the program, and we have our, our people in the city that are staffed who are overseeing those volunteers. And it took us a while to get there, but I feel so um, I feel so strong. Uh, I feel like our, our staff in all of our offices really get what we're about, and we're in constant contact with them weekly. Very similar for us. So. We have, um, you know, we have a budget of about two and a half million dollars, which is almost entirely for staff in each of those regions. And we've learned over the years, you know, where our staff are needed and where we can ask a partner or school to do some work, where we can use technology. So there's a lot more room for us to use technology to, to improve. But in essence, it's a step function with uh, every new kind of frontline program staff member that we bring on can support 50 simultaneous apprenticeships, so 50 relationships. Uh, and so as we raise more funds and have enough visibility to, to trust that that's not a one-time uh, funding opportunity, then we can gradually expand staff. Uh, there's a lot of room for us to use technology to manage those relationships online, and we're experimenting with a few ways to do that. Uh, there'll always be a human touch that's very important, but we're trying to figure out where is it really required, and then you know, where can it be accomplished through other means. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that uh, I think is interesting and somebody asked a question about is um, how did you guys, these seem like pretty big visions and big dreams, uh, how, how did you guys come up with that? I can say, you know, for me it was just through direct experience. I, I was placed in a seventh grade classroom in West Philadelphia and started teaching, went through all the joys and struggles of being a new teacher, and then somebody told me the stats for my kids, and they said that more than 50% of the kids that you see in front of you are going to drop out, and that about 20% of the boys that you see in your classroom are going to end up in jail, statistically speaking. And it just hit me that this problem is its happening directly in front of me, and it's, it's also happening nationally. So when I thought about uh, being an entrepreneur to, to work on this problem from the start, I felt like this is not just a West Philadelphia problem. It's not just a problem in my classroom. Uh, this is a national problem. And you know, we're not a silver bullet, but we want to build something that shifts the whole system and taps into a new resource. So from the start, uh, you know, we were probably naive in some ways, but we were shooting for the moon, and we continue to. Um, and I'll jump in there. When I was um, 32 or 30, 32, I had just spent so much of my life see, seeking um, seeking my worth in external things, you know, the job, the the relationship, or whatever. And I really did. I had a kind of hit bottom and had an epiphany while out on a run. And and I believe in some ways that um, I mean my life changed dramatically. And once I had sort of seen 
my own potential as I did on in, in on that day in that run. I, I really couldn't go back to not doing something, and it was like um, if if I knew if it was if if I could tap into my own potential, why then can't others? You know, and why can't I help? And it, it you know it really is just what I'm supposed to do. So it become it, it quit being a question. <laughs> it just wasn't and, just and what I'm supposed to do. And what was your work experience? leading up to that that and how did that impact your ability to implement and your idea yeah you know I was a teacher um, I had been an elite athlete um, in, in a triathlete um, social worker I had a master's in social work um, and you know it is funny when I look back and often when I'm talking to groups you know especially 20 somethings it's Everything in my life, and I believe Ashoka sort of points this out when they do our history, led me to doing what I do. All of the dots sort of connected in this sort of golden way. And um, they continue to do that. Like I continue to see these dots on the timeline of my life, and I look forward not only, I mean, I'm not done. Like what else is there? And how are the dots that are, for, that are currently being made going to connect in my own future? Wow. Um, so... Last question for you. We have about five minutes. This is the last question uh, for for each of you, um, all three of you. Is, um, hearing these kind of inspirational stories, I think may have given some people some energy here to get engaged in uh, social entrepreneurship in some ways. You know, what advice would you give to somebody in terms of the get, best way to get started with something like this? And we'll, maybe we'll start with Karobi. Sure. Um, well, I thought the list that Chris had was a great list in terms of, of looking for board opportunities and volunteer culture. But I think, um, I mean, obviously, the, the, the first thing is just to learn as much as possible about it. Learn uh, about different social entrepreneurs. Visit their work. Learn about their work. But I think that for Ashoka, and I and I think for me personally, I think one of the best ways to get involved is to look at the people that you are bringing into either your business or people you are connecting with, and look at the the sort of the people skills that they have. Um, do they have Ashoka's working a lot, um, and Molly is one of the leaders of this on our empathy initiative. Do the people that you bring in and connect with have empathy? Are they able to lead teams? Are they able to have leadership skills? Um, in other words, are they going to be creative problem solvers, whether in your business or out in society? Because the, the, those skills are similar. And I think that's, that's a fundamental shift that I, I hope we can see. Um, so I, th I think you know, start at home, start close to home um, in terms of who you hire, who you partner with is, is often a, a good place to, to start exploring the world of change making. Great. And I'd say, and, and this is a, you know, broad answer also, but, you know, to really find your interests. You know, for me, I didn't realize it would be education until I just got a little bit of exposure to what was happening. Um, first, you know, through an internship for me and then through teaching. But you know, everyone lives in a community, <laughs> no matter where you are. Um, to start understanding what are some of the challenges in that community, and then get some direct exposure. You know, nonprofits tend to be very open uh, entities, so to go and uh, pay someone to visit visit a program, uh, and then don't be afraid uh, afraid to apply your business skills. Uh, you know, there's obviously you know, business skills aren't aren't a silver bullet either, but a lot of nonprofits are really thirsty for that. So whether that means uh, as a board member, as a volunteer, uh, enabling others in your business to be volunteers, uh, and also as a philanthropist to apply you know, a business and investor mentality uh, in philanthropy, all those things do good and blend in you know, a needed skill into the sector. And I'm not sure this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stray a little bit. Um, I, I, think the, I think for me, or for, it, it's identifying where your pain is. And I know that sounds weird, but like, what what do you read in the news, or what do you see, where you just feel this like ump in your on your insides? And I, I, I think that combined with where your joy is, like what what uh, those two things somehow magically make for a great social entrepreneur. Um, and then the other thing too is, 
I've found that some of my greatest ideas come when I'm the most quiet. So I really do think that it's important, um, and we encourage all of our volunteers to, to take quiet time more frequently than they might think they need it, because it's in those quiet moments where the big ideas come. Great. Well, thank you very much to Karobi, Molly, and, and Chris. Um, really a great introduction for all of us to this concept and really inspi inspiring, inspiring stories. Um, really astounded and, and, and inspired by, by the work that you guys are doing. So thank you for that. And thank you to all of you for participating. Um, for those of you who haven't already received the invite, uh, the invitations for our May 24th program uh, should have hit or will be hitting shortly. If you want more information on that, which is uh, a program on growing the family business, and we'll have four member case studies on May 24th. Um, information is on our website, www.luc.edu slash FBC. Um, hope you can join us there, uh, and you can register online as well. So thank you again to, to Chris, Karobi, and Molly for uh, sharing your stories with us, and we look forward to seeing everybody on May 24th. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.